Final Ending of the Crowd, Part 1 down below. Given that Kaitlin was old enough to have peers whose parents had separated, I believe she understood. Kristen, but, never did. Both the time she left her mother and the time she left me, she sobbed. And I thought I was the worst person alive. My cell phone would ring a couple times late at night after I gave Tiffany my number. They seemed to be breathing and possibly crying, but they didn't say anything and hung up quickly. I was aware of who it was. I was also aware of her pain. However, I was also. I could have given up at any moment. I had the option to go back, and I would have had our house and our old life back, along with her and the girls. However, I would never have what I really want. I started to question whether she had been faithful, and I pondered whether she had been and if she might be. She was still right about everything she'd stated to me the day she announced we were taking separate vacations. She was lonely and terrified of change, and she missed me. However, that didn't change the fact that we weren't a good fit. It was not the right time for either of us to get married. After some time had gone, I received a notice and, on a Wednesday, appeared in Circuit Judge Catherine Holden's courtroom three months later on an accelerated timetable. There I was with my pathetic lawyer, Jeffrey, who I don't think even had the courage to address the opposing counsel. His hands trembled, and I wondered once more if the world saw him for the blazing alcoholic that I knew he was. Tiffany sat beside Matt Henry, looking like something out of Betty Crocker in a subdued powder blue top and matching skirt. The judge questioned us, but she didn't turn to face me. Mrs. Davis, it's clear that your husband initiated this divorce action and that you opposed it as well. However, you haven't raised any red flags, requested counseling, or asked your husband for a portion of your assets or child support, which in nearly every other case involving such a large financial gap is almost a given. All he's asked for is a fair portion of time with your two daughters, and you've not only granted him that, but even more time than he asked for. I have to say, you have both surprised me. I understand that you've already indicated, Mr. Davis, that you won't consider counseling, but could I ask you to reconsider? Morgan gave me a quick glance. No ma'am, I would not consider it. She gave Tiffany a quick glance. It would be well within my rights to order both of you to undergo at least three months of counseling, Mrs. Davis. In this case I can't help but feel that you two have not apparently had any discussions of the underlying problems that led you to this courtroom. Would a delay of three months pose an intolerable hardship to either of you? No ma'am, she responded, staring at me. I don't want you to order counseling. Bruce has already indicated he'd rather go to jail than sit down with me and try to save our marriage. I don't have a lot of pride left, but I have some, and I will not force him to sit down with me when all he wants to do is leave me behind. The judge looked at me sharply. Is that correct? You said you would go to jail before you'd sit down and talk with your wife and a counselor. Yes, ma'am. And if I said I would put you behind bars until and unless you agreed to go to counseling, I could hold you for six months without even another hearing. Would you be prepared to go to jail for that length of time just to gain your freedom from your wife and family? I'd go to jail. If you held me for a year or two, eventually you'll be replaced or die. And I'm not seeking my freedom from my daughters. I love him. I just want to be free of my wife. Are you in love with another woman, Mr. Davis? Do you have plans to engage in another relationship after this divorce is granted? No, although I hope I will find someone else after this marriage ends. And I hope Tiffany can do the same. She shook her head, first at Tiffany and then at me. I am not legally able to ask you about your emotional relationships because no party has made any accusations of adultery, infidelity, or anything like. That's all it is. I've spent seven years on this bench. I have witnessed numerous divorces. Divorces can occur when a couple grows apart or loses interest in one another. I no longer even need to search for the evidence because it is so evident. You two still have an emotional attachment, and when there is that kind of passion, there's almost always an outside precipitating cause. It could be adultery, infidelity, suspicion of infidelity, or some other emotional harm or injury that one or both of you cannot overcome. But that's not the case here. In your court filings, none of you has claimed any kind of conflict. Rather, you have acted more sensibly, responsibly, and in your case, Mr. Davis, selflessly, than the spouses who simply don't give a damn about each other anymore. She cast a glance down at the papers before her. To be completely honest with you both, I don't feel good about approving this divorce. I'm going to ask you again. Would you think about counseling, or would you just think about delaying it if that's all you're willing to do, Mr. Davis? Allow yourself an additional three months to consider your actions. If you still desire them, these divorce documents will still be available in three months. No, sir. It won't matter in three months. It won't matter in three years. She gave Tiffany a quick glance. Tiffany refused to let go even as she turned to face me with tears in her eyes. No, respect. I won't get in the way of my husband's desire to get rid of me if that's his true motivation. Give his divorce to him. A divorce is approved. You are free, Mr. Davis, and you are free, Mrs. Davis. I hope everything goes well for you too. The divorce merry-go-round never stops, and Tiffany didn't even glance at me as she and Henry left the courtroom. I sat back down for a minute, and then noticed that a new attorney and new clients were ready to sit down. 
I'm very tall and in fairly decent condition, and I've had girls at the store and female customers come on to me, but I never took advantage of any of the offers. I didn't when I became a bachelor for two months. I walked out a free man, but freedom is overrated. A dark-haired woman and her elderly silver-haired grandma entered the store one mid-December night when I was covering for a sick manager at Blockbuster. The two women were talking in Italian. I grew up with a fairly good understanding of spoken Italian, having grown up in the country before my father, an Air Force man, met my mother, who was born in Naples, and spoke it roughly. When they asked me a question about a movie, I answered in English without thinking. A payson, and not too bad on the eyes, the grandmother murmured to her granddaughter in Italian as they both peered at me and tipped their heads as if attempting to recognize me. Try a little flirting. I blushed a little and answered, I understand more than I speak, my mother was born in Naples, again in English. I appreciate the praise, and your granddaughter is far too attractive to be pursuing men. They ought to be after her. The granddaughter, who was gorgeous with long black hair, red lips, and a set of fronts that almost overshadowed her sweater, smiled slowly as the grandmother turned to face her. We had bone-chilling freezes as early as December, so even though Jacksonville is a Florida city, the weather is more like to South Georgia, so it was sweater weather because the city gets cold in December. It was also pouring, which made the colder. Nevertheless, she was enormous, and prior to meeting Tiffany, I had returned to Naples with my mother to see relatives, and I had the idea that the majority of Italian kids would never go hungry, since almost all Italian women appeared to have large fronts. Oddly enough, my girls were the ones that started the breakup when we did. She had liked the girls too much when they first met. We need to talk, she said, and I felt a chill run down my spine. Those are four words you never want to hear, whether it's from your wife or your girlfriend. Where are we heading? That's another four words that no single guy wants to hear, yet that's what she requested. I'll be back at your place soon, and perhaps tomorrow we can watch a movie together. With a smile, I said. She gave a head shake. I mean it. Who are we? Play partners. Girlfriend or boyfriend. Those in love. Would you ever like this to be permanent? She read me as I struggled to think of a suitable response. Delana, why are we discussing this? I said, why can't we just be buddies, goof around, and sleep one other's asses off? I heard every time I see your girls, she whispered, resting her face on my chest. I am aware of your devotion for them. They truly appeal to me. But I want children of my own. It doesn't get any younger. I'd make a fantastic mommy. Have you ever considered us? She was a good woman, sweet and lovely, and she wanted more from me than I could give it to her, just as I had wanted more from Tiffany than she could give it to me. I could not lie to her. That was the last time we spoke, and when I dropped her off at her apartment, we shared a kiss and I knew there was no point in phoning her again. A year later, I received a card from her announcing her wedding in a large Mandarin Catholic church, but I didn't go because I couldn't believe I had been so foolish as to let her go. She was a wonderful person in a terrific time, and I didn't love her. It was a Sunday night in April of 2007. I was at home at 11 p.m. after ending a shift at my home blockbuster when the phone rang and I answered it. It was the sound of their mutual slumber. She let out a long, shuddering sigh and he inhaled loudly and then it sounded like he was resting down beside her. She wasn't that good an actress, I don't think anybody could be. She needed a minute to catch her breath, and just as I was about to hang up, she did. She began with a whispery voice and grew stronger as she spoke. Bruce, I genuinely feel bad for you. You lost a woman who loved you because you had a wild hair and your emotions were harmed. And now, unless you'd settle for some pitiful time, you'll never get me back. She finally said, Bruce, are you still there? Tiff, not again. Never call again. I cracked the flip top off my cell phone and, when it rang once more, I put it on the floor and murdered them both with a clock radio. When that, I went to my liquor cabinet, took out a nearly full quart of Jim Daniels, and started to get really wasted. Even though I didn't have a lot of extra money, I had to replace my cell phone because I needed one. And when she tried to give me a stereotypical phone cuckolding two nights later, I destroyed the new one completely. I got a third phone and broke it three nights later, even though I didn't want to replace it because there has to be a way for the corporation to get in touch with you. I was aware of my foolishness, but I had no choice except to destroy the phone, drive to her place, which used to be our house, or crush him in his flat. If I did the latter, I would not be able to see my girls again unless it was during jail visits. A kick to his back sent him through the doorway, slamming the door open so hard it bopped him in the face before he got all the way in, bringing the cheap wooden coffee table to splinters. Two weeks later, he was walking into his apartment about 8 p.m. in the dark when I came up behind him just as he unlocked the door. He went to his knees and shook his head, and as the door slammed back, it bled his nose and broke his lip. He was bleeding. It sucked the breath out of him, and he just laid there for a minute. I sat on the couch opposite him and just stared. Glancing up at me, he noticed that I had shut the door behind us, meaning that we wouldn't likely be disturbed until our conversation was over. You trash, I'm bigger than you and I'm going to crush your face in, no matter what kind of karate junk you try. You are a coward. Had to leap ahead of me. You're terrified of me. Not only do I have a bigger D than you, but I also make Tiff scream louder than she ever did for you. I extended my hands in a gesture of reconciliation. 
I'm sitting here in peace and quiet right now. I won't pounce on you. Would you mind trying to kick my behind? Please. I could have killed him, but I broke his nose instead. He stayed down longer that time, but eventually he just shook his head and rubbed the blood out of his eyes. He had the heart for it. He got up and charged me. And after I put him down, he got up again. He was holding his side and he couldn't breathe right. You know she loves me. She is not merely inciting you with that statement. She could spend hours playing with it. I let her suck me until my skin becomes sore. Furthermore, there is absolutely nothing that I want to do that she won't do. You're the stupidest moron I've ever known. You threw away that piece of ass because you got your feelings hurt. I just stayed sitting on the couch across from him without saying anything. I'd sent him into his huge screen television, which had been hanging from the wall, and it was now a collage of glass and metal on the floor. Two seats held nothing but kindling. Scattered about his den was a quite good mounted modern artwork. You can still leave and I won't hurt you. He grinned, really. I had to force myself not to like him. Here, move. Well, let me get myself up, he said, approaching me so quickly that I didn't notice the chair leg until it was zipping by, hovering just above my head. I seized it from him and struck him, first in the stomach, then over his kidneys in the back. Like a balloon with a spike thrust through it, he deflated. He was not going to get back up this time. I took a seat again, and eventually he managed to roll over onto his back. For the first time, I could see he was tired when he looked up at me. I guess, I should, taken that karate crap, seriously. But, I always, thought, it was, camera tricks. He spit blood and laughed. Shows how much, I know, right? For a wuss, you didn't do too badly. For a few minutes, he reclined and attempted to take an air. I guess, you're going to beat me, to death now, right? No, how can I beat you to death? I was never here. I'm in a video game marathon at a friend's house in St. Augustine right now. I've been there for the last 18 hours and I'll probably be there for the next 24. Got seven people who will swear I never left the house. So I got the crap, kicked, out of me, by a figment, of my imagination. I'd say a burglar or two, maybe home invaders, broke in and you fought them off. You can reach a phone and call the cops and have somebody here in a few minutes. He grinned in return. I could probably call them in time. For them to catch you before you got back to your alibi. And, what would you do then? Spend a few years in prison. But I'd get out. And the next time I'd have an ironclad alibi and I'd rip your D off with my bare hands and cripple you so you'd never walk again. I'd do it even if I had to go back to prison. You can buy a gun, but you can't watch your back forever. He inhaled deeply, coughed up blood once more, and then breathed in tiny breaths until he was able to speak once more. I guess I have to. Chalk this up to. Experience. I'm going to miss her. You know. But she's not worth dying for. I stepped off the couch and squatted down next to him. I didn't reach for him even though he briefly pulled back. You can still see her. What? I divorced her. You're right. I lost the right to say who she can sleep and if she wants you. That's okay. But, I gave him a quick peek down and chopped in the direction of his D he winced. But, you will never, ever, go along with her calling me while you two are sleeping together again. As long as you live. I don't care how you do it, but convince her that would get you killed. If she really likes you, she ought to be willing to stop tormenting me. He gave a head shake. I thought it was true. You still love her, don't you? Why in the hell did you throw her away? It was the best thing for both of us. Don't try to figure it out, and please, if I can ask you any favors and I won't hurt you if I find out you went against me, don't ever tell her I still love her. It would just make things worse. It felt as though I had never left when I got up and left the house in the middle of the night and returned to my friend's all-night gaming session in St. Augustine in an hour and a half. Nothing further took place. A week later, the children told me about Uncle Stephen fending off two men who broke into his house. Mom wept and accompanied him to the hospital for the entire day. After a while, she and Uncle Stephen returned to their jobs, and the police were unable to locate the two black men who had attempted to rob him. At 11 o'clock on a set of night, my most recent cell phone rang. Hello Bruce, to what do I owe the pleasure? Stephen told me everything. He probably suffered a little brain damage from that beating he took. No telling what he thinks happened. I feel guilty. You hurt him really bad, and it's all my fault. I won't call you again like that. Thanks. I knew you still loved me. The sad thing is, now, it doesn't matter anymore. I could never be satisfied with you now, even if you came to your senses. And even though I don't call you, you know I'm going to be sleeping him. As often as I can. Because I can't get enough of him. I remain silent. Do you ever wonder, Bruce? Sometimes late at night and you're all alone, what it would be like if we were still together. I know you'll find other women. But they won't be me. This time, she gently hung up the phone instead of slamming it down. It seemed like the end of the world, yet, still. For the next six months, I partied, went on dates, and had several sexual encounters. In the spring, I accompanied the girls to YMCA soccer practice in Orange Park and to school activities. In the months that followed my brief, heartfelt conversation with Stephen, there were occasions when Tiffany and Stephen were seated 50 feet away from me on one bleacher as I cheered the girls on from another. Every now and then, we would look at one another and nod. They were not overbearing when they cuddled and looked at me, but I could see Tiffany chatting to Stephen. 
They were simply another couple with children under observation. Then, in the summer, I noticed that Stephen wasn't there anymore when I went to pick them up or when we went to summer camp activities and theatrical camp because Kaitlin was a blossoming actor. Not for a long time, but he was gone. The girls had stopped seeing Stephen two months ago, and the next time they came over, I quietly pumped them and found out that he had started to disappear four months earlier. Mom had informed them of her and Uncle Stephen's decision to end their relationship. They merely wanted to take a break, they weren't arguing. Mom hadn't sobbed, Kaitlin informed me, but she had appeared depressed for a week before appearing to be back to her normal self. While Grandma watched the girls, the first new guy they had never seen before came to pick up Mom on a Friday night. I pondered whether she had finally had enough of his enormous D or if he had dumped her. She had now turned to playing the field, similar to me. Thus, we tried not to notice each other's activities as we lived our lives in parallel. The only thing that united us was that we were both young girls, one of whom had her period and had begun to grow little buds. Then, as a teenage or even preteen girl, I was actually relieved that Kaitlin had a mother since I in no way felt capable of leading her through the perilous seas of adolescence. Six months or so after Tiff and I got divorced, my life underwent another significant transformation. When a large, dark-haired man arrived at one of the Arlington blockbusters with six DVDs to return, he was swearing under his breath as he dropped the discs off and then took out his phone to dial a number. Usually, I struck up a conversation with familiar clients, trying to let them know about new releases that were worth renting. I knew this guy, he was always a happy-go-lucky person, always wearing a 10 on his arm, and usually with a different 10 each time he walked in with a woman. Clearly, this was not his night to rent. I'd give you the new release list, Mr. Fleming, but something tells me you're not in a DVD-watching mood. Is there anything I can do to help? With a shake of his head as if to physically chase away the evil thoughts, he said, Oh, hey Bruce. Ah, nothing you can do. It's just a goddamn shame that when you pay people good money to come up with words for you, the sob get drunk and overdosed and I wind up trying to come up with the copy myself. And I'm not a word man. I had assumed he worked in public relations for a little Jacksonville company. Over the past couple of years, we had a brief conversation about the ups and downs of the PR industry whenever I ran into him. After a while, he stopped talking and gave me a look, as if he had finally noticed me. Bruce, am I remembering correctly? You write novels and short stories. Yeah, plugging away. Haven't sold the novels yet but I've placed some short stories. You ever done any non-fiction? Any PR or promotional writing? No, could you? I don't know. I doubt it. I don't really know anything about that type of writing. I haven't even tried it since college. There must be tons of guys around that have experience doing that kind of thing. Yeah, there are, but I don't know any I can trust that will finish a job for me tonight. Tonight? You mean, like in the next four hours or so? You'd have till 8 a.m. tomorrow, which means about 11 hours. You ought to try to find somebody else. If I can't get it done, I'd feel bad about getting you in a bind. We're a boutique agency, so you know we're small but we work for high-end clients and have a solid reputation that we've built up over the last 20 years. Hank, Henry, and I are the owners and partners. We built it since we left UF. Hank has always been the wordsmith and idea man, and I handle clients and sales. I'm already in a bind, Bruce. We had to bring in three writers because we recently grew a bit too large for ourselves. Which was sufficient, but we need material for an upscale retirement community, and it needs to be sent to the printer by tomorrow in order for them to meet the deadline for their national advertising campaign. My last hope was just busted by the cops for possession of cocaine after plunging his car into the front of an Orlando nightclub. He blew a 19, which means his blood is basically almost pure alcohol. Two of our writers are overworked on big accounts that account for a good chunk of our income. Hank is a walking zombie because of his family situation. Unless you could help me, Bruce, I am completely out of luck. It would give us a chance, even if you are unable to accomplish it. You'd be better off looking for a pro. I'll take it, but I'll tell you right now I might not be able to do it. I'm going to, but in the meantime could you try to crank out some copy? I've got some samples, they're talking points, stuff that will show you what they're looking for and what we need. I read it over between customers and brought it home after telling him I would. I slept in at 4 in the morning, and woke up at 6 in the morning, in order to reach Jacksonville in time to arrive at his office by 7.30 a.m. I had written my content based on what I believe the owners were attempting to market, keeping it as straightforward as possible. What they were selling was security and confidence that, Although you were becoming older and would require assistance with everyday tasks, you were still superior to 95% of working stiffs and that their place was the ideal place for someone exceptional like you. Of course, it was all horse manure, but it satisfied older clients' dual requirements of stroking their egos and allaying their fear of death. Though I wasn't sure if my material was any good, I believed I had hit the mark. Vic Fleming was sitting across from me, and I watched as he went over the copy once, twice, and a third time. Candy, get that to the courier and get it over to the right place before 8 a.m. She accepted it silently, shot him a look that would have melted steel, and then turned to look at me as she left. All the nerve endings in my body were tingling. 
I remarked, half jokingly, who do you have to kill to get a job around her? She's a very sweet lady, high IQ, great secretary, happily married, and the mother of two small boys. But she's also wonderful eye candy and we've gotten a lot of business from guys that were dreaming about getting between her legs. Fortunately, he said in a tone that only I was able to hear him, she likes what I have between my legs. She loves her husband, but she's not fanatical about it. Subsequently, his gaze returned to me. It's not the best or most polished stuff I've ever seen, but it's usable and good enough that they'll come back to us. For a first-time effort, on the fly, under unbelievable deadline pressure, it's pretty damned good. What do I owe you? I've got no idea what to charge. Whatever you think is fair. He took out his wallet, gave me 500 bills, and then reached inside his desk to retrieve a form, which he slid toward me. Sign this. You're signing away any rights to your text so we can use it whenever and however we please and you can't come back and sue us if it winds up making somebody a million dollars. That's because you're a freelancer. If you were working in the shop your work would be covered and we wouldn't need to do this. I was shocked to see the $500 when I first glanced at it. $500 for just two or three hours of genuinely focused labor. It was a pleasant alteration. I extended my hand, shook his, and stood up to go. Before I was able to leave, he asked him, would you like to try this again? I think with some effort and maybe a little training by one of our regular writers, you'd be a valuable addition to this firm. The money is good for freelancers. I'd like someone who can write fast and turn out acceptable copy. I gave a shrug. Sure, I could always use the money. Ever thinking about doing this full time, if it works out? I took a moment to consider it. Nah, I don't think so. I like Blockbuster and the people I work with. This way I've got time for my fiction writing, I'm keeping my Blockbuster option open, and I would almost always be available when you needed a quick turnaround. He merely gave me a nod. Before I left, he said, I could introduce you to Candy. Maybe you could go out to lunch sometime. Let her fill you in on how the office works. It would be good to know. No thanks. I could tell you were impressed and she's been around here long enough that I know when she's interested. It might be fun. And it's a definite perk to working around here. I gave a head shake. No, no offense or anything personal, but I'm not interested. I divorced my wife six months ago and I think she might have been running around on me before we made it final. I just don't, I don't want to do that to some other poor bastard. He gave me a sad smile as he glanced at me. You and my friend Hank. God, I'm glad I've never loved anybody like that. Sometimes I think I've missed out on something important, and other times I say my prayers of thanks that I missed out on it. I left and created advertising texts for Vic and Hank for the following 18 months, and made enough to treat the girls to a couple pleasant places and boost my bank account. I was making more money on the side than I did at my full-time blockbuster job, but I was by no means in Tiffany's league and I was wondering if my dreams might end before my own life, having received more than 400 rejections for the great American novel. Vic Fleming straightened up a little in his chair behind the large marble desk he had moved the company's headquarters to three different sites over the years due to growth or tactical relocation. It was probably something very simple, but he had a childhood memory of seeing a desk similar to this in a documentary or motion picture, and he had the desk made to his specifications once he and Hank started earning the kind of money they had never imagined. Behind this desk, he always felt more powerful, more in control of the world around him. In an apparent attempt to appear more presentable for the young woman who was about to enter his office, he straightened his posture. He motioned to one of the seats in front of the desk, and she gave him a little smile before sinking elegantly into it, crossing her legs to show off some really fine leg wrapped in sensual nylon. Miss Hampton, I believe it was. I appreciate your taking the time to come down to our office, but I would have been happy to meet you. She gave a head shake. No need. I had business downtown and I wanted to talk to you in person and meet some of your staff. And it's Mrs. Hampton. I'm keeping my ex's name for a while since some of our larger customers are familiar with me under my married name. Meet some of our staff. I'm afraid I don't understand. She bent down to give him the documents she had taken out of a tiny suitcase she had placed next to her chair. She moved forward, revealing some really lovely little but appealing body swells that showed off her cleavage. He questioned whether it was an accident. He examined the documents she had given them. They were mostly print advertisements, with a few radio ad transcripts and television ads with still photos attached. We have previously worked with other advertising agencies, but our firm's owners and I felt that they had become a little stale over the past year. We began examining the work of some other agencies, and some friends suggested that your agency handle some of our upcoming advertising campaigns. We obtained a list of your clientele after deciding to research your business and began perusing the print and media advertisements you had created for them. We received a delightful surprise. It's difficult to describe and we haven't quite figured out what it is about these advertisements that strikes us, but the simplest explanation is that they are new. Their ideas and writing don't seem to be the same old same old. Over the past 10 years, I've worked with a lot of advertising firms, and I believe I've developed a quite discriminating eye. I appreciate the effort and tone that whoever wrote these and created the buyer's market pitch had. 
I'd be happy to meet with anyone on your staff, but I really would like to meet the individual or individuals who did these. Fleming examined them, finding that the majority could be located with ease. A handful were more difficult to locate, but he was able to locate them after a brief flash of memory. It did not surprise him. I know who did these, Miss Hampton. We run a small shop here as I'm sure you've been told. Our total staff including Mr. Clark, my partner and co-owner, and myself, amounts to only 15 people including secretaries. We have four writers and idea people. One is Hank Clark, we have two writers on staff, and a fourth writer who is basically a freelancer but on call whenever we need him. He placed the documents down in front of him on the chilly desktop made of marble. A fourth writer completed all of these. He works as a freelancer. I actually introduced him to the company approximately a year and a half ago. During a tight period, I met him at his full-time job. I knew he had written a few things, so I asked if he would be interested in trying his hand at copywriting. The rest is history because he did. When I first started working with him on freelancing projects, he was usually on time, produced quality work, and worked quickly. Reliable, quick, and good. Beyond that, things don't get much better. She glanced at the documents underneath. He worked here part-time, right? I'm inspired. Really astounded. You have no idea how much awful material I have had to sift through over the years, from individuals who were meant to be trustworthy experts. I'm quite surprised that you let him hang out there as a freelancer. Somebody else is going to notice this guy and snatch him up. Regretfully, he enjoys his full-time work and writes fiction part-time. He's one of those guys who keeps attempting to write the great American novel. However, a few months ago, my partner and I made the decision that we didn't want him to go. My partner, Hank, and I have always owned everything. We gave him a 10% ownership share that would be solely ours when we split the business 45 over 45. He will receive half of the equity if he writes only for us for 5 years, and 10 years of service will earn him 10% of the business. He has the option to remain or sell his portion and leave. Everyone wins in this situation. 10% ownership for a part-time employee. I'm not sure whether I've heard of that. Certainly, in the land development industry, they do not act in that manner. Even after more than 10 years of employment with my employer, I remain a hired hand. I'm a well-compensated hired hand, yet I have no equity in the business. I'm envious of him. We had to give it a lot of thought before we did. Hank and I both live our lives via this firm. Our regular writers are also excellent. However, this man is something unique. Before Hank experienced some personal issues, we were often concerned about what would happen if he was sidelined for an extended period of time. I may be able to sell ice to people in the North, but I have absolutely no sense of language. Our writers are competent, but they are also workhorses who can complete any task given enough direction. Yet, in spite of the cliché, this guy is one of those guys who can truly think creatively and has an imagination. Furthermore, if he stays with us, Hank and I may gradually step back and let him take the lead while maintaining some degree of control because he is younger than us. Like I said, a win-win for everybody. She was alluring, but he really didn't want to go through the divorce dance just yet, especially when his fourth wife was about to enter the jealous bee stage. It's better to be safe and responsible than sorry. She returned the documents and said, I have some ideas and I'd like some of this word man's input. Do you think he'd be willing to meet with me tonight? There's a nice, new Thai restaurant in Bay Meadows that I was wanting to try out. We could eat and talk. I'll put it on my tab since it's business for him. He's single so if he's free there'd be no problem. Give me your number and I'll call him and if he can make it I'll have Candy, my secretary, call you. Okay, sure. By the way, what is this thing's name? Davis, Bruce Davis. My acquaintance was once married to a Bruce Davis, but I'm not sure if that's the same guy. The union did not last. Still, Davis isn't a particularly odd name. As well as the Bruce Davis that my pal wed, would never become a rising star in the field of advertising. That was not the type of guy he was. Ask him directly. Sometimes the world seems quite little. At 8 p.m., I entered the Star of Siam. Candy called me since Vic had to go for a crucial business meeting. I believe he simply needed to return home and sleep with his fourth wife. He was preserving the marriage by a strong sense of camaraderie, perseverance, and a firm determination to avoid getting divorced for a time. Over the course of the last year and a half, we had become acquainted, and I was aware that he was having an affair with her, just as he would have an affair with whoever replaced her. I'd always liked him in spite of that, and the differences in our perspectives on women and life. He didn't really make any bones about who he was. Women were replaceable beauties, useful for a single task and for clinging to your arm at social gatherings. Apart from that, I doubt Vic had ever felt anything profound about women in his life. In that regard, he was the total antithesis of his buddy and soulmate, Hank Clark, and Hank had the scars to prove it. He was as much or maybe more in love with his wife as I was with Tiffany, but she had subjected him to an unbearable torment. And yet, they would survive to reach the other side. In a way, it was humorous. Tiffany and I would never be together, but she'd done him far more damage than anything Tiffany had ever done, and they were together. Just goes to show you never know. The waitress led me to a room off the main eating area when I inquired for a Mrs. Hampton. 
As she pushed past the beaded doorway, I noticed Mrs. Tiffany Hampton seated at a table near the rear of the tiny space. Beside her, she was rummaging through a briefcase. Beside her sat a glass of what appeared to be white wine. She turned to face me. She wasn't grinning, but she wasn't furious either. She embodied the epitome of the contemporary entrepreneur. She didn't seem to be missing a hair. She could afford to dress to flaunt her physique and face, as evidenced by the slightly appealing clothes she wore, but there was hardly any cleavage or leg visible. Hello Bruce, this is Hampton. I didn't try to get a seat at the table, instead, I stood across from her. You going to sit down? I'm not sure. Most likely not. Not at all. Vic Fleming, your supervisor, described you as a company man who was always prepared to go above and beyond to complete a task for your organization. Still, I have to admit that I find that difficult to accept. I never know a Bruce Davis who would go above and above for anyone, in particular for a job that earned him a respectable wage. I assumed that, somehow, earning a respectable living went against your religious beliefs. As I gazed at her, I was astounded that she still looked so nice and that my initial reaction to her was exactly the same. For that reason, I'm not taking a seat. Mrs. Hampton, this isn't a business meeting. This is simply one more of your devious attempts to manipulate my thoughts. It's very creative, I must say. I went to great lengths to ensure the girls were unaware of my new profession, but you still had to find me. Then you needed to conduct research on my work so that you could enter and act as though you were considering buying my copy. Tiffany, it's been two years. For ourselves, we have created new lives. After engaging in an affair with your long-term partner for almost a year, you swiftly got married and went through a divorce. It's so difficult for you to just leave me alone. I don't follow you around all the time. I came here solely to see what your latest idea is since I was fascinated. Reaching for the white wine, she took a slow sip. Then she put the glass down on the table and looked up at me, her countenance bland but slightly smiled. Bruce, how do you keep your head up straight when you're so full of yourself? Do you go about your life believing that you are the center of attention for everyone else? Are you truly so self-centered that you believe I would take the time to follow you around to learn that you have a new job? I would next look into your copywriting and act as though you're trying to find a new company, only to get another chance to speak with a man who, eight years into their marriage, dumped both his daughter and me. Just in case you missed it, I learned that there are other guys in the world, greater and superior than yours, to be exact. Perhaps I haven't discovered a better spouse yet, my initial endeavor following you was, I'll confess, a pathetic failure, but I'm searching and in due course, I'll locate one possessing a substantial one, the capability to conceal it from me when he's not around, and sufficient self-assurance to coexist with a woman who is uniquely herself. Men who are like that do exist. Simply said, I didn't see them the first two times. My knuckles turned white as I gradually clenched my fingers around the back of the chair in front of me. Tiffany, that's why I'm not seated. You would think that after two years, the poison between us would have been removed, but it doesn't. I keep returning like a bull charging at a red cape, so you have to keep tearing at me, says the man who hasn't spent any time, or even spoken to, his ex-wife in two years because he is so afraid of being around her. Bruce, I know why you can't bear to be around me. Reminding yourself of what you lost or threw away is intolerable. You're acting like a little kid by hiding and pouting, and you refuse to go outside and play. This is hopeless. She said to me, you are such a coward, as I turned to walk away. You are afraid of women if you are a big harsh karate bully. You're scared to even have a meal together and do business over a chair. Stud, what exactly scares you so much? No, I don't bite, and I'm not even going to kiss it in your case. Does that help you feel better? I took a seat. Now, let's discuss business. I would not allow you to touch any portion of my body with any part of yours, by the way. There is no way to know where it has been or what you have been doing with it. She gestured for the waiter to bring my order, adding just in time for her to arrive. As the waitress took our orders and we got to talking about the material I had written, the exchange was tense to say the least. I must admit, when Fleming shouted your name, you could have given me the proverbial boot. For a moment, I wondered whether I had accidentally entered the twilight zone. Me, Bruce, composing business copy, getting into business for myself as a partner, and earning a really good side gig as a freelancer. To be honest, I had no idea you were capable of it. I studied her expression, expecting sarcasm, but she seemed earnest. It was nothing I planned. I can believe that. I was just at the right place at the right time. And you're a good copywriter. Writing is just writing. Simply said, this pays a lot more. What I said was real, Bruce, whether you believe it or not. I didn't search for you. I came across Fleming and Clark since the organization is searching for fresh ideas and new blood in its advertising department. You have a modern style and copy. The more money Fleming and Clark make, the better off you are, we need new talent. Why don't we have a look at some of the projects we're working on and share your opinions with me while we're here? She rejected some of the concepts as being ridiculous, cliched, derivative, and full of horse crap. In contrast, some caused her to tap her chin with a pen, which is typically an indication that she was reflecting hard on a subject. Taking out a legal steno pad from the briefcase, she began to take notes. I glanced around and saw that we were the final patrons of the eatery. 
It had reached 11.45 p.m. somehow, even though they closed at 12. The waiter lingered close to us, impatiently awaiting our payment and departure. Before I could grab the bill, Tiffany said, No, this was on me, I said. This is the commercial world. Funny how, when you're having fun, time just flies. Well, it was kind of enjoyable. I questioned her definition of fun and expressed my curiosity. She chuckled. You realize this is the longest we've talked, the longest we've been together, without snarling at each other in two years. Proves that nothing is insurmountable. Do you believe any of the topics we discussed would be of interest to the partners? She closed the briefcase and continued putting the papers away. Yes, in fact, I believe they could be. I genuinely believe they will be. We will most likely get in contact with your supervisors again within the next few days to a week. I'll most likely represent our side as the point guy. Could you collaborate with me for a few weeks or for as long it takes to complete this project, in your opinion? As long as it's only business related. It wasn't all that horrible, really. At least I know that spending time with you isn't the most agonizing thing in the world. I've had worse experiences with root canals. Amazing. When we were married, I had no idea you were so amusing. By the way, are you actually seeing anyone? You haven't gotten married again, I noted. Since our breakup, I have never married or even been divorced. I suppose it takes me longer to settle into a relationship. Are you going to jump in again soon? Not at all. I'm going to let it cool for a little. Focus on the girls and my work life. Oh my goodness, did you know that Kaitlyn is dating a small boy? Already, the little bastard is attempting to convince her to participate in kid-friendly games like Spin the Bottle. To calm him down, I had to speak with his mother. She told me about it. She told you. They both do communicate with me, believe it or not. All I advised her to do was to kick him in the balls if he became too naughty. I'm glad you showed her that birds and bees communicate so she can learn about masculine attributes and how to attract a man's attention. Her smile made me think for a split second that I was seeing the former Tiffany. Could you ever have imagined that we would be concerned about shielding our daughter from arrogant boys? I feel like a hundred years old sometimes. Where did the time go? I was resolved to avoid getting emotional. I'm not familiar with Tiff. I hope I did. I hope. Never mind. If Vic or Hank schedule a meeting in the future, I suppose I'll run into you. A pleasant adult-only bar is located approximately two blocks away. Tonight they have a live band and our music. It's mom and the girls tonight. Would you like to wind down with a drink? Not at all. Regards, but not. Tomorrow I have to report to work. Even stroll to your car with me. She shook her head, looking up at me as we stood next to her old Lexus. Bruce, when did you go from being a man to being such a wimp? You decline a beautiful woman's invitation to have a drink when she offers. I swear, during our outing, I will not be comparing your D to Stevens. Never mind. I anticipated that you wouldn't be able to drink with me. We are both aware of what is about to occur. And that is, you'll end up pleading with me for a fun time. And I'm going to leave you like that, with your tongue hanging down to your knees, this time. You are so full of crap. Then prove it, tough guy. When the last call was issued at 2 in the morning, individuals started to finish their drinks and scramble to find last-minute couplings. Oh my god, I'm not going home without getting busted by a cop at all. I scolded myself for being such a moron as I glanced around at the empty cups. Why had I allowed her to entice me to have a drink? It had been enjoyable. We sung along to songs from the late 90 seconds and earlier, when we had danced and slept together throughout our college years. I had forgotten how much fun she could be. When she averted her gaze from me, I saw that I was staring at her. Why on earth did she need to be so dysfunctional? What had prevented me from leaving her before I entered a marriage and had two little daughters? If they were gone, though, would the world still be worth living in? They weren't, but perhaps our marriage had been a mistake. Neither am I how about we hail a cab? Share a cab? Not at all. Unless you really don't think you can resist touching me while we drive home. Since we arrived, you have had intense feelings. Discuss about your exaggerated sense of self-worth. This place is full of extremely attractive women similar to the large blonde over there. And I should care about that, why? Men are swine. Would you like to hail a cab? After 45 minutes, we were frolicking in the compact living area of the flat I had occupied for the previous two years. She had never stepped foot in my flat before. We seemed to be lying there for a very long time. I eventually rolled over to the side of the bed. I'll get a taxi for you. You should be home in about an hour, even if it's late. Leaning on her elbow, she raised her gaze to me. Together, we showered and got dressed, her for work and me for lounging about until it was time to head into Blockbuster. She sipped coffee from my coffee maker while sitting across from me at the little kitchen table. Where to from here? I go back to my life, Tiff, and you go back to yours. She gave me a dejected look. Last night changed nothing. I gave her a direct glance. Tiff, what could possibly change? Could it increase my love for you? Could it intensify the bonding even more? I've forgiven you for the long ago harm you caused me. And I suppose I accept your claim that you and Steven did not have sex while in Hawaii. I could have moved past that even if you had. However, but Bruce, you still have to take responsibility for me. You must have this antiquated marriage that very few people outside of the oil states have anymore. You are my property, woman. Yes, I suppose that's how you look at it. 
You, the whole of you, must be in our marriage. Everything you have, cash, love, dedication, everything, is all in. Running sneakers are no longer kept under the bed. You must finally go past your father's betrayal. She gazed into her coffee cup as though it held secrets she could decipher. Could we at least occasionally see each other? In this manner, I suppose I could survive if I didn't wake up next to you every morning. If I were aware of that, we weren't done together forever. My heart turned to stone, even though all I wanted was for her to smile. Tiff, I won't see you again. I am unable to. My heart is breaking over this. I know I can't of you, yet I want you more than anything else. As you are not ours, you've never been like that. You hide a certain aspect of yourself. For almost a decade, I made an effort to live with you in the hopes that you would change. However, you never did. Tiff, you never will. It's not in you, in my opinion. She got to her feet. So this is goodbye. Once, for all, and truly. It's goodbye, indeed. I didn't follow her out the door. I buried my face in my palms and pondered if I was the most foolish person to have ever lived or merely one of the unfortunate ones. I had just stopped by Candy's desk to drop her my most recent assignment. My birthday was on September 17th, and it was September 15th. Vic and Hank had asked me to come by Sardelli's, a lovely family-run Italian restaurant, for a birthday celebration and workplace party on the 17th. Candy was dressed in a reasonably modest suit and light blue shirt. Her breathing caused the blouse to split open, revealing cleavage unlike anything Delana had ever showed me. She smiled as she peered up at me as I bent over her desk to look down at her, getting a nice view. The view from up here is heavenly, Candy. She gave them a small bounce or wiggle that made me aroused and uncomfortable. I thought I might rip my zipper. Bruce, it's always good to be recognized. However, it always seemed to me that you were trying to stay out of office entanglements. Candy, you were wed till six months ago. I didn't want to get involved with a married woman, no matter how attractive you were. For this reason, I've always considered you were a good man. Many men wouldn't care that much, but I am aware of your motivation. Together with your ex, Candy, finally finished. I'm eager to go on, even though it took me a while. Are you currently dating anyone in particular? She shrugged, which made those feel good too. Would you consider a nice guy that's interested in your body? I didn't think you were ever going to get over that ex of yours. I needed some time. However, I believe I am prepared to go on. Do you think the past is behind you? Actually, for the past few years. I know a lot of guys in this area believe I'm just a slut, but two years ago was probably the best time for us to break up. Simply said, he was a wonderful man and father. We simply weren't suitable partners for each other. Would you consider being my date to my birthday party? You ask a girl for a date two nights ahead of time. I understand that you have a busy schedule and that this is short notice. If it's not possible, at least remember me for the future. Relax a bit. Yes, you can have me as your date. Right now, just for kicks, right? Candy, nothing hefty. All I want is some eye candy for my arm that evening, no pun intended. Then, let's observe its course. She gave me a fake slap. Damn, but it's good for a girl's ego to be around a man who really, really appreciates what she has. Consider yourself appreciated. After saying hello to Candy's two young children, who seemed to want to be friends with my two girls if the opportunity arose, I picked her up from her west side house and we headed toward the downtown area, where Sardelli's was situated just a short distance from the enormous Bell South Tower. After searching for parking for a long, we walked three streets in the muggy September air, which made me sweat, before entering Sardelli's. Arancini di Rizzo rice balls were popped back with red wine, and most of the secretaries, the word guys, Vic and his new wife Honey, who was clinging to him by her fingernails, and Henry and Patricia Clark were all there already. I received greetings, congratulations, and jokes about how being 33 was the official mark of official old age. When you were almost halfway through your retirement, you were no longer a child. When I laughed back, Henry and Patricia came over to give me hugs and pats on the back. Looked ten years younger than he had when I'd started writing for him and Vic, Henry, no, Hank, as everyone called him. And that makes sense. Although I arrived somewhat belatedly, he had been through an absolute nightmare as a husband and wife, tormenting him in ways beyond my comprehension. After one night of drinking, he stated the only analogy he could think of was two fish trapped on the same hook. There was no way for them to escape each other, no matter how hard they battled and thrashed to get away from one another or damage one another. Observing them and being somewhat aware of their experiences, I contemplated if I would have swapped places with my supervisor. He had been through hell, but adultery was not unavoidable. I was unable to go back in time, earn the trust of the lady I loved, and get her to eventually offer herself to me. It's possible that I may have fought another man or men. However, how do you atone for a father's transgressions? Vic got up and replied, Okay, okay. We finished the main course and appetizers and were enjoying some almond tortrones and marzipan lucky pigs for dessert. If only you two would quit eating your faces. The birthday boy has something to say now. Bruce, make a clever comment. Unaccustomed as I am to public speaking, I added as I stepped up, and even though it wasn't funny, the entire room burst out laughing. Perhaps because most of us had our backs to the wind, around two sheets. I pounded my vacant wine glass against the surface until the chuckles subsided. 
Joking aside, though, I'd want to express my gratitude to each and every one of you for attending and for organizing this party. As you are all aware, I work as a day employee at Blockbuster, therefore my pals and I sort of act like a family. Those men, I've known them for years. However, I feel as though I've gained a new family during the past year and a half. I consider you pals. I paused and surveyed the room, recognizing many of the faces. Most of you don't need me to tell you that this has been a lovely day. Difficult two years for me. My union came to an end. My spouse passed away. I received fifty more rejection slips regarding the great American novel. At that moment, the room erupted into fits of laughing once more. Everyone was aware of my chase of the gan, as they called it, and made jokes about it. I pretended to be angry as I said, thanks one hell of a lot. You are one of my pals. However, the truth is that if I hadn't met Vic Fleming one fall night, those two years would have been far more isolating, icy, and agonizing for me. I'm grateful, Vic. I took a seat after that. Vic got up once more and said, in the spirit of the night, I'd like anyone who'd like to make any comments about our friend to stand and do so. I'd like to say a few words. The entire group, myself included, turned to face the woman standing in front of the private dining room entrance. She was carrying an enormous handbag on her arm and was wearing a stunning black outfit. I'd given them her image, so a handful of them recognized her, but the majority of them were simply staring curiously. I had eyes I couldn't believe. She moved around the room until she was standing in front of the table that Candy and I were seated at. Tiffany, why are you acting in this way? I pondered. Believed we had made a settlement. Concluded matters. Bruce, I didn't come here to make you feel bad or to cause you any problems. Please give me a moment so we can discuss. Tiff, couldn't you have completed this at another time? For me, this was a party. I was enjoying myself greatly. Do you exist, Jesus, to bring me misery? I swear, once we're done, I won't get in touch with you or trouble you in any manner again. Honorable word. Candy reached over to touch my arm. Bruce, give her a few minutes. You must. All right. Tiff, what would you like to say? Reaching into the bulging handbag, she produced a snub-nosed 38 revolver. I sensed the sudden gasp for air throughout the room, not heard it. I froze as she held it lightly in her right hand. Subsequently, she extended her hand and placed it on the table before me. Reaching back into the handbag, she produced a small purple box, which she placed on the table next to the handgun. You could have heard a pin drop, in my opinion. Open the box, Bruce. My two hands trembled a little as I reached out and raised the jewelry box lid to see matching wedding bands made of diamonds. There were two sets, each made up of two gold bands that were exactly the same and woven into a diamond-topped Mobius strip. She went to one knee and gripped the table with one hand as I struggled to make sense of it all. Bruce, I would like to ask you to marry me in front of God and your friends. Are you going to marry me? I lacked the words to convey it. Bruce, it's a really easy question. Will you wed me? Return to me as my spouse. Return to my life. Tiff, Bruce, you were correct and I was not. Now that I see it. Not that I'm holding back. Not a different account. Not a prenuptial agreement. Without holding back. For the rest of my life, I want to be your wife. I want to share my bed and morning hours with you. I want to be in your permanent family. All of me. All I could do was look at her. Were I dreaming in my house? It was something I had always desired. And I was in shock when I realized I had it. Are you sure, Tiffany? I understand how difficult this must be for you, but what if we end up dating again and I discover you're not sincere? I'll be ruined by you, sweetie. Or you might do the same. She had stood up once more and picked up the ex I heard folks gasping once more. Bruce, I will not be changing my mind. You had better not, however, modify your mind. She pointed the snub nose of the ex toward the ceiling while holding it. Bruce, I realize that I'm messed up. I had known it forever, and I've seen how mom's life was ruined by what dad did. It's all thanks to him that she is who she is. However, I made the decision not to let him ruin the remainder of my life after bidding you farewell the other morning. I want you in my life because I adore you. I'm going to take a chance on you not being my dad. However, she stated, not even flinching as she looked at me, I am not being wholly naive. I'm going to take this and blow your balls off if I ever, ever, ever catch you playing around with me. Bruce, that's the agreement. This is what you wanted if, after two years, you haven't been lying to me and you still love me. I've exhausted my options. The initiative is now in your hands. The diamond rings were left on the table in front of me by her. I'll let you go have fun with your pals. Bruce, consider it and come to a decision. She pivoted and commenced her exit from the private chamber. Candy gave me a back of the head whack. Don't be an idiot. I had Tiffany by the shoulders before she made it to the room's door. She was in tears. You do realize that this is unrelated to your success, don't you? I adore it. I'll own up to that. However, if you were a beach bum and just worth ten cents, I would have accepted you. Bruce, I've learned my lesson. I promise not to let you go once more. I won't let you or the girls go again either, I whispered into her ear as I embraced her. For the rest of your life, you will be with me. After that, I spun her around and started presenting her to my pals. And life goes on, as a really brilliant writer often says. My F comment. Because he is making real money and has a different job with ownership potential, I believe she wants him back. 
When she left him behind for the vacation, it was precisely what she wanted, and they didn't get back together until she learned about his copywriting work. You know people like this in real life. Pause I do. Comment down below. What do you think OP should have done? Comment down below. Sub and bell and I will catch you in the next one.